since we still don't know why biocontrol isn't working, we're probably going to need to use pesticides for a little while longer. But I'm going to start this section with a disclaimer. You might have heard that onion thrips are more susceptible to pesticides than Western flower thrips. I said it earlier in this talk. Um, but as far as we can tell, that's true in general, but it's important to note that onion thrips um, or sorry, more susceptible susceptible doesn't mean that they're not pesticide resistant. Onion thrips have a proven ab ability to develop resistance to many different active ingredients. And studies show that their level of resistance can be highly variable. Take this 2005 paper, for instance, looking at resistance levels to three different pesticides in Ontario onion fields. The eight sampling locations here that I've highlighted are, are all in the same municipality. But you can see that the resistance varies dramatically for all three products. Diazinone, for example, that I have highlighted with the blue arrows, um, caused 90% mortality in one population, but only 10% mortality in another. Since we think that most thrips are coming from outside, this means that they might be coming in with pre-existing resistance, depending on the pest management practices of the outdoor crops in your area. We also usually find onion thrips and Western flower thrips together in the same crop. So we need to take their resistance into consideration as well. Okay, now that that caveat is over, on to my lab trials. Um, I didn't have time to do a comprehensive pesticide screening with multiple populations and several different rates of each product. So this trial was done using, my, uh, using adults and larvae from the onion thrips colony um, in my laboratory. These thrips were originally collected from a greenhouse that uses primarily biocontrol and have been kept for many generations with no pesticide exposures. So this is a best case scenario in onion thrips population which means that if a trial doesn't work in these lab trials, it's probably not gonna work any better in a commercial operation. Uh, I tested five commonly used pesticides that we know have worked for thrips in the past. I used the highest recommended label rates for thrips in greenhouses, uh, sorry, in greenhouse ornamentals for each of the products. Um, the method that I used is a leaf dip method. Um, so I dipped the I dipped chrysanthemum leaves in these solutions for about 30 seconds and then let them air dry for about 30 minutes. Uh, I then added 10 thrips uh, into a, onto the leaf in a container and then I counted the number of live and dead thrips after five, or sorry, after two and five days. So these are the results at the end of the experiment uh, at five days. The x-axis here is percent mortality, so 100% means that all of the thrips died, as was the case with success. The dotted lines show the cutoffs for what is considered control versus suppression versus partial suppression. As you can see, success was the only one that reached the level of designated as control for both adults and larvae. Both pylon and ferrets meet the cutoff for suppression, but belief in pontos performed pretty poorly. However, in addition to the mortality they caused, ferrets and belief caused feeding cessation, which put an immediate stop to damage, which is beneficial in and of itself. But also eating is pretty essential to life. So these products uh, could also result in higher mortality over the long run that just wasn't captured in a five-day trial. Since the overwhelming majority of growers in Canada are using biocontrol, they're likely looking to find a product that is both effective against thrips and doesn't obliterate your biocontrol agents. In terms of efficacy, success came out on top. The caveat here, of course, again, is that this is only tested on my laboratory population, so you might get different results depending on the levels of resistance in your thrips population. And even if you are getting high mortality with success, we don't want to overdo it. When success first hit the market, everyone was really excited about it, but Western flower thrip thrips developed resistance in record time. So if you wanna make sure that these products work when you really need them, um, rotate your pesticides, use biocontrol as much as you can, follow all those uh, resistance management tools that you should all be familiar with. Um, so after success, ferrets and pylon both delivered a decent level of suppression. 
To figure out compatibility with BIOS, I did a literature search as well as consulting the BioBest and Cobert side effects databases, and then compiled all of this information to create a very general overall compatibility rating. Overall belief seems to be soft on most biocontrol agents. There is very little uh, information on the compatibility of ferrets though. Um, it's believed to be soft, but this is mostly anecdotal information. Um, so if preserving your bios is super important to you, it's probably um, better to tread carefully and assume that they might be slightly to moderately harmful until we know more. Contos and success are both slightly to moderately harmful depending on the species of biocontrol agent in question. Um, so again, if you have uh, bio or if you have bios that you're particularly concerned about maintaining, consult the side effects databases. Um, and pylon, however, even though it worked well, is really hard on bios and likely won't mo won't suit most IPM programs. So it's probably only useful if your crop is at a stage where you don't care about preserving your bios. And we also want to consider damage cessation. Visual damage is obviously important to ornamental crops, um, but again, probably will contribute to their long-term long -term mortality. I observed damage ces cessation in both belief and ferrets, um, but not contos. And since success and pylon had a really high mortality rate in my trial, it's difficult to judge whether this took place or not. So when you put this all together, there isn't a product that was the best in all three categories. Um, I would say that success and ferrets offer the best balance of efficacy and compatibility, but each grower will be, have to figure out what suits their own crop best based on the stage of their own crop, based on what other pests they need to manage, how important it is that they don't mess up their biocontrol program, et cetera. So if you are planning to spray for onion thrips, there are some things that you can do to make sure you're getting the most out of your sprays. Step one is to identify which species are in your crop and figure out what the proportions are. We don't actually have a threshold for pro what proportion of onion thrips you should have um, at this, and it's probably gonna differ depending on the crop, but anecdotally, once you reach more than like half onion thrips, you probably need to do some kind of intervention to avoid excessive damage. To get a good sense of whether or not the sprays are working, um, at least working the way they should, do standardized plant taps before and after spraying to make sure that the thrips population is actually decreasing. We have found that sticky cards aren't always reliable for assessing the resident thrips populations, so plant taps are the best way to quantify the thrips population that's actually in the crop. And lastly, whatever pesticide you choose, you probably want to reapply bios after spraying unless it's the end of the crop cycle. Keeping in mind that a product can still cause up to 25% mortality in your biocontrol agents or reduce their fitness in other ways and still be given the not harmful designation. The most important part of this process, in my opinion at least, is the standardized plant tax because this is pretty much the only way you'll know if your sprays are actually doing what you think they are for sure. To do this, you'll sample a predetermined number of plants. So let's say you tap 10 plants per bench spaced evenly apart down the bench. And then the actual number of plants themselves isn't super important. What matters is that you sample the exact same number of plants each time. So you'll tap the plant gently but vigorously over a white tray and collect all the thrips that fall out. You want to count all of the thrips that you collect, and ideally, you also want to ID which species you have and assess the proportions. Um, for identification purposes, if you have collected a bunch of thrips, a subsample of about 50 to 100 thrips is good enough to give you a good idea. Then you can repeat this at weekly intervals before and after your sprays. Because resistance changes over time, you want to do this every time you decide to spray because just because it worked in the past doesn't mean it's going to work again in the future. It might seem time consuming to do this process every time, but spraying is also time consuming. Also, it's expensive. Um, so I think that you, you probably want to make sure that it's actually doing what you want it to.
Okay, so for an example of what this looks like in practice, let's take a look at a case study. This is the same cut mum grower that I referenced earlier that was doing all of the right things in terms of biocontrol and ended up with mostly onion thrips. They ended up deciding to spray ferrets um, and they let me come in to collect some data before and after those sprays. Of course, we had started by identifying their thrips. Um, they had uh, almost 80% onion thrips in the hard hit varieties, um, but they actually had a better balance of thrips in some of the other varieties. So they actually only spot sprayed the varieties that had this really high concentration of onion thrips. Um, I did standardized plant taps before and after spraying and using this data, I was able to determine that after two sprays, they had reduced their onion thrips numbers by 50%. Meanwhile, their Western flower thrips numbers were completely unaffected. Compared to the results of the lab trial in which I had 58% to 81% mortality, these results are actually quite reasonable for a commercial trial. So spraying wasn't able to eliminate their thrips problem, but ultimately the grower was happy with their, the results because it saved their crop from disaster. They did some more sprays after this and their onion thrips numbers declined further, but they still have an established population. So as suspected, these sprays gave them suppression, but not eradication. And this case study is a really good illustration of our current onion thrips situation. Pesticides can help you avert disaster when onion thrips get out of control, but it's not a sustainable long-term solution, which is why we still need to find a way to improve biocontrol so that we can avoid getting to this point, hopefully, as much as possible.